So I just want to get a, a feel for the room. Uh, so raise your hand, like you know, uh, when I call your name. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, raise your hand when, uh, like you know. So basically, uh, who here is uh, a math teacher? Raise your hand. All right, so we've got a good number of you. Um, who here is an uh, administrator? Uh, counselor? Counselor. Uh, um, let's see here. Curriculum coordinator. Got one, two, three. Okay. And uh, who here has uh, students with problems with math? <laughs> okay, good. Good, good. Did I miss anyone else? Anyone else? Excellent. Great. Right. Okay, John, go ahead and. Uh... My name is John Hoopenthal. Uh, I am a volunteer math teacher in uh, South Phoenix in the highest crime uh, zip code in the state. And we're talking about a project that we've been working on with these students. And this is my guest. And uh, Hi, I'm, I'm Nye 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 Wang. Thank you. And I'm Nye, and I'm the tech guy. Um, and uh, basically, um, you know, we got together and we created this pilot project uh, at, at his school. Uh, last spring, and you're gonna like you know gonna catch a glimpse as to into the uh, a lot of some of the research we threw into it and the results and and and, and uh, see like you know how these how we were able to transform these kids from that environment into uh, and create math fluency. So uh, so we have an email sheet going around the the room, the yellow sheet. So you know if people come up, you know we're gonna email you a copy of the presentation and some data and things like that. So uh, get your name on the sheet. Make sure to write legibly, uh, please. <laughs> because we, I know, I'm sorry. But yeah, penmanship is, is gone. Um, and things like that. So, so we're here, and I just want to kind of introduce the concept of, you know, you know when you take these kids uh, who are in inner city, like highest crime, crime poverty, you know, kids who feel like that math is completely irrelevant to their lives. They play video games, they do sports, they, they are, uh, Part of like nefarious activities, um, and uh, you know you have stories like some kids like coming up, up to you and saying, you know, can you bail me out, it's rage, and things like that. And so basically, you know, math is the last thing on their minds. And you ask them the question like, what's two plus three? And you know how they do it, right? One, two, three, four, five. The answer is five by counting on their fingers, because uh, they don't know how to do math any other way. It's intimidating. They have low self-esteem because you know they don't want to be made fun of. So they're just like, math, we don't want to do that. So how do we go from some kids who are like this to this? This is a kid. Um, he want to describe a little bit. Like right now he's, uh, he's psyching himself out. He's going to enter the game arena okay. to perform and answer as many questions in 60 seconds. And those of you in the back, I don't know if they will read this, but this is the time. And this is uh, every single green square is correct, the red square is incorrect. So, just, uh, can you read that in the back, the numbers? Can you actually read the numbers? <laughs> I mean, can you compute this? So you can see the speed that he's going, and you might try and keep up with him as he's going there. This is a, the result of 45 days on the, the, in this software yeah. environment that we created. So how do we get kids who don't like math to become highly motivated to answer math problems like this? He say it's like it's diverse algebra equations, and uh, you know this kid here is about we say level 30, uh, like 700 uh, currently. You can see that X is moving around, so it's not just rote. He has to think. He has to. <clears throat> do some algebraic thinking as a part of this. So it's like lightning fast. Like I can't even read that fast. Sixty and zero wrong. Sixty so, and zero wrong. Like he's done that, sixty right and zero wrong. Yeah. His total correct is two thirty four, so he's missed one out of two hundred and thirty five problems so far that day. This student here cranks out a thousand math problems a day. Ninety nine percent of all students in the United States do seventy or less. And our Typical student in this class does 700 math problems a day, um, and these are from the highest uh, at-risk population in, in the state. Two-thirds um, African American, one-third Latino um, student body, um, 
they're very highly risky. And this student right there actually came up to me and he said, Mr. H, will you bail me out? And I thought he was joking. I looked at him, he wasn't joking. I don't know what he did, I didn't want to, really want to know. But uh, I said, Ronnie, you gotta get your life in, in order. So, the, this is no small accomplishment, what we've done. Reading through thousands of research papers, um, what we've done is really clearly a breakthrough. So, hey, I'll turn it back yeah, on so basically, uh, you, you gotta ask yourselves, like, you know, how do we get to that level? How do we get to that level of fluency and literacy and, and mathematics? So, you know, so that's what the, the whole entire gist of this presentation is, basically giving you insight in some of the research that John has gone through and, um, and basically a little bit about my life story. So basically, um, I'm, I'm not going the founder of Kate Becomes the tech guy, and uh, John Bukenthal is the math genius. <laughs> so we can tell a little bit more about ourselves here. Uh, so I want to basically set the, set the ground, uh, uh, set the foundation of like, you know, why I'm here talking to you. Um, because I had a, a, a arduous journey in education myself. Uh, first off, I had a lot of disadvantages growing up. You know, like, um, like everyone else, we all have disadvantages. But like the biggest one I had was I was made in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. you know, go ahead and laugh. It's, it's funny. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I, my parents immigrated here uh, from Taiwan, you know, to you know to basically have a more prosperous life uh, than is there. And we opened up a Chinese restaurant. And it was a struggle because if you know any uh, restaurant owner, like you're always like you know paycheck paycheck or like you're trying to make the bills and things like that. And uh, so being that I was, uh, English was my second language, I had a lot of reading problems. My reading comprehension was terrible. I made it through high school without uh, reading a single novel because the, when I read the words on paper, it just, just goes in one eye and somewhere out the back and I don't even know where it goes. Um, so I had a lot of problems with that. And on top of that, to compound it, I also had ADHD. Anybody have any kids they know that has ADHD? <laughs> just a little bit. So, you know, so my, my parents had to deal with that. But fortunately for me, I guess. <laughs> um, we were so poor that they couldn't put me on, med uh, on medication to deal with it. So instead of having to uh, having it medicated and mass the problem, I had to work on it and basically turn it into a muscle. Uh, but um, on top of that, because of my ADHD, I failed a math class. Now that's really funny because I am Asian. <laughs> and the stereotype does hold true that Asians are really good at math. It wasn't because I was good at math, I just did not um, compute with uh, the way that the teachers taught. They were going so slow. My ADHD wanted them to go at 10, like 100 miles per hour, and they're going 10 miles per hour. So oftentimes I fall, fell asleep in class because I was like, okay, come on, you can do a little faster here. I get this, and I'm like, and I don't pay attention, and I fail class because I was goofing off. So since I had to deal with it naturally, I turned the ADHD into my superpower. <laughs> really, it is. It's a superpower because now I'm able to look at the world, you know, visualize things, uh, pull the information at a far greater rate and retention than, I, than, than my peers. So I can actually look out. And sometimes it's so odd. I can look at something, and I'll tell you there's 18 of those. I don't even know how I came up with 18, but somehow my brain counted 18 without actually going through going through that. Maybe I, I can look out in this room and I can say there's like 37 people. I might be right, I might be wrong, but I don't know. Um, so anyway, so, so my mind, I was able to turn it into a really super powerful competing device because I had to you know, work with it. And, and then because of that, you know, I'm able to exercise it in a subconscious level and know things without even knowing it. It's really strange. Okay. And uh, that led me to video games, which is one thing I'm gonna, a topic I'm going to talk about because we got to be the gamer generation coming up, everyone's playing video games, and that entire aspect um, completely shapes the minds of our kids. Into programming, which then, I, you know, basically how I got into education was I created a curriculum in coloring arts because of my rec restaurant background. P2, basically give kids a way to be able to learn a way that I wanted to learn uh, within that field, and there's my education. So I'm, I'm in ed tech, and I love it, because we're doing some really crazy, awesome things uh, with technology. So uh, we live in a generation of instant gratification. Okay, we're going to stick this in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. <laughs> I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. Look, I googled it. It's a fake pigeon. <laughs> Kidding, boys and girls, everyone gets a cake. Okay. 
I love the Big Bang Theory. I'm so glad they got renewed for a couple more seasons. But yeah, I love this clip because it illustrates like that's what the kids are growing up with. They never had to like you know search for information. They had it right here at their fingertips. Mm. They can ask Siri uh, what the weather is. Like, hey Siri, how's the weather? And I can also ask my watch. I have to say this early. Hey Siri, how's the weather? There you go. It's currently partly cloudy and 35 degrees in Nashville. All right. Temperatures ahead. Right, that's, that's enough. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> so, so amazing. You know, so, so they never knew the, the work that we had to do to get information. So you know, remember when you had to physically relocate yourself to a library and use the what do you call that? Thing? No, no, no. no. Oh, and then, uh, the book. yeah, the book. And go to the location and get that book, and you go, oh darn, it's not there. Somebody misfiled it. <laughs> And we're even worse now, you go into the stacks, you, you go to this big old machine, you put this ribbon in it, and you scan through this, what's they call it again? Micro page, yeah, exactly. And then you're looking for that article, you spend hours on it, and you realize it's the wrong one. But hey, it's too, too bad, paper due tomorrow, so I have to base everything off that article. So now it, it's all instant, and this is what we're caning through, is, is this instant gratification culture, the video game culture. So this graphic here is like one of those like things, the key principles that, that I believe in, in in education and what we do in tech is, is uh, basically how uh, the, the kids growing up and the form of entertainment shapes the way that they expect information. So back when uh, you all were growing up, uh, the only form of uh, entertainment um, was uh, television. So when, when they wanted to discipline you or get you um, like discipline but get your attention and, and, and not make you run around in circles all over the place, they put you in front of the TV, you're watching cartoons, and you're being entertained by them. So the story's being told to you, you, know, you, love, uh, you love these characters, you grow up, you, you go to Disneyland, you buy the Mickey Mouse ears, take horrible selfies, and then uh, and you're enamored with these characters. So what this is doing is it's teaching you as, at a very young age that, you, that sit still, be quiet, and, and take on the information passively. So when we go into the classroom, you're sitting in these nice neat rows, and the teacher's talking at you. Back in those days, that actually worked because that was the way we were trained to take information. So they say, yes, it does compute. But then when video games came out, that completely changed, gave it a paradigm shift on, on how we consume entertainment. So as kids, instead of just saying they're watching TV, now we're interacting with these characters, Pokemon, you know, Super Mario. Any Mario fans out here? Oh, we got a few. Awesome. Um, did you know that Super Mario is like the most iconic character, rec more recognizable than Mickey Mouse around the world? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's staggering. But anyway, so, so basically now you're falling in love with these characters, you're interacting with them, you're making decisions, you're, de you're deciding like, you know, how well you want to complete the level, whether you want to do it once, twice, three times, one star, two star, three star, whether you want to master it, you want to you know, find all the unlocks, you want to do everything you know, for that level, and, and you're making these decisions. decisions. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I go a million miles per hour because of my ADHD. So if you need me to slow down, raise your hand. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, they get to, get to the classroom, they sit in these nice neat rows, and then they're going, the teacher's lecturing at them, and they're going, that's not compute. I want to control my, my destiny. I want to make decisions. I want to be able to, like, you know, experiment. You know, you know, I want to, you know, fail and try it again and try again. You know, I want more active learning. You know, all these different things. And, and then because of that, like what happened to me in, uh, in math class, you know, I disconnected and I fell asleep and then I ended up failing a class and having to take it over again. That was one year behind everyone. Sucks. But anyway, and I did end up going through CAP 2, which is great. So, <laughs> so, so this, is like, this, this whole entire shaping of the ed entertainment industry it are, is what you're, going, you're facing now and you're going to be facing even worse, especially with mobile technology where any two or three year old can pick it up and interact with it and play games. You know, anybody have any kids pick it up and say, you know, start playing Candy Crush or you know, start you know, purchasing hundred dollars worth of, of coins from your account and and yeah, because it's, the touch interface is so natural, you don't have to use a joystick, you don't have to use a keyboard, <coughs> things that require like some sort some sort of dexterity skills, um, changes the whole entire game. So because of that, you know, we have what we call the Maslow's hierarchy of gaming because video games satisfy our cravings in a certain ways. So first off, it gives us a sense of belonging you know, through social interactions. It gives us self-esteem by overcoming challenges. And it gives us self-actualization self uh, by contributing to a living world. So, so these three aspects are what makes video games addicting. And it, you, know, you probably have a kid who like, you can't tear them away from a, a video game because they're getting fed 
these needs through the video game environment. So, so we translate that to education by basically focusing on some key aspects like you know, uh, team score. So you're, you're seeing like you know, the play capture flag you see uh, in the video game, not in the real world. Um, and then like, you're seeing your team score go up. So, uh, so that's giving you some, some like, you know, uh, little kudos here. You know, individual accountability, so you have your own stats that you're working on. And then you have individual success. So when you score a goal for a team, you feel pride, you feel uh, happy for that moment, and you go at it again. So, so that's my background in ed tech, and I, one of the things like, you know, I want to do is like, take that thing like video game addiction and make education addicting. So, on a plane from Nashville, three years ago at ACT, you know, I've been around for a while um, in education, I you know, do a lot of stuff in, in corners. I happened to sit next to this gentleman here, uh, John Bithal, um, where he started telling me about some crazy ideas that he wanted to do um, and John, go ahead. Well, my journey on this started when I was appointed to an education committee back in 1992. And I felt like I didn't know anything. And I promptly went over to the university and just started pulling stacks of research papers out of the, out of the, uh, <clears throat> off the shelves and going through them, literally hundreds and now amounting to thousands. And slowly over the years as I did that, just stayed at it, I came to the conclusion that our classical classroom just wasn't working too well for students from poverty and, and particularly for minority students from poverty. And so this was a unique meeting because when we talk about Maslow's hierarchy, this classroom wasn't working for those students to go to have any of those needs met that Maslow tells us about so much. And so what we did is we started to, uh, you know, we went back to the to the basics here and said, man, this whole brain of ours was meant to operate, was designed in this kind of tribal environment. Um, we were out on the plains of the Serengeti, and what we found out was we were meant to operate as a part of a team. Um, if you hunt alone, you starve. And basically, we designed this classical classroom all around hunting alone. And, but that's not the way our brain was designed. Um, when we hunt together, we feast. So the whole idea in this, in our software, is these students hunt as a team. They are fused together, tightly fused together. And that produces unbelievable motivation. Um, cooperation is in our DNA. And boy, when you get this right in the classroom, it's amazing what you can produce in the transformation of individual children. So how do we um, make that in the classroom, John? So that's what it's all about. How do you take <laughs> this hunting culture and move it into the classroom? And that was Nye's genius, you know. He came, he talks about those motivations, Maslow's hierarchy. And so there were seven key principles. And what we're going to do is we're going to just go down through those and show you how this software environment that Nye created um, um, well, you integrates can... those principles. Yeah, it was your way we just kind of implemented it. Yeah, so, and, and, the, and the key with the, uh, the, the, the principles is like, you know, everything has to work in concert. Like, one part without the other, you know, well, we don't know, actually, because this pilot had these principles, so we're going to be, like, trying other experiments. Yeah, one, one missing piece, and the whole thing didn't work, can we? You know, we have our ideas, and we had to, as we got into the classroom, we found out, okay, this isn't quite what we anticipated. You don't just flip a switch here. We, you had to have everything working together. So, number one, the, the overall arching thing that was critical was to develop a team mentality. So they literally, in this classroom, it's like a basketball scoreboard. They know real time, second by second, how is the team doing? The whole classroom. They, we define the, the classroom as a team, and we start to fuse them together. The technical term is positive interdependence. You can call it, that means a win, they have a win-win relationship. It's not the classical classroom where in order for you to do well, somebody else has got to do poorly because there's only so many A's to go around. This is a win-win environment. And we, we make that team score really important through a variety of ways. And that's, that creates that sense of community. And once you get that into their, that culture, and it doesn't happen overnight, um, took a little bit of time and, and persistence, once that's in there, boy, do they want to show the other students that they're the top dog, you know? And they, 
they are really highly motivated uh, to move up. So it's a mathematics culture. It's a part of their personal identity, how well they're scoring, how fast they're going, and it is, it just is transformative for these children. So we have, but we have accountability not only at the team level, but we have it at the individual student level too. So every student walks in there and they have a negotiated objective for that day. And there's a list and every student knows what everybody else's objective is. So here would be a classic negotiation of an objective. I come, there's a new student in the class, she's been in the class about a week, and, and so I've watched her do some work, and so I'll come up to her and I'll say, um, Jonice, it seems to me that a good objective for you would be to do about 120 problems. And she just goes, ah, 120 problems? And I'm going, okay, how about 40? And she'll go, she stiffens up and she says, no, I'll do 120. But that's key. What we found is when we do that negotiation, by turning it over to them, you would be surprised. They want higher objectives. So we're more often negotiating them down, making sure that they're going to achieve it, than we are negotiating them up. And so they, and after a while, they develop a really good sense of how high their motivation is and what they can do. Um, so it's a uh, individual, there's individual accountability, team accountability, everyone matters. That emphasis on the team score um, enables us to um, um, keep track to of total volumes of work and to know that, geez, this thing is on course. These students are doing 12,000 math problems a day and that's a really high rate of practice. And we don't see this much at all in education. No. So what does that do? So, Upper echelon families, they're constantly sending this signal that your academic achievement is critical to your stature, your status in life. So the upper echelon students, they get that signal. But quite often students from poverty, they're not getting that signal at home. So their brain, the brain, human brain literally feeds off of that status signal to say, because it's getting terabytes, petabytes, gigabytes of information every day and the brain says, ignore all this. It, you know, and what it wants to focus on is, is skills, learning that are important for its for your status as an individual. So the upper echelon fact of students are getting that signal at home. Now all of a sudden, what we do, we provide that signal very powerfully in the classroom, and they buy into it. They buy into their personal identity being a part of their mathematics achievement, and it's enormously motivating. But it also is a critical signal to the brain. Learn this. Learn it powerfully. Learn it permanently. Not temporarily, not just for Friday and forget it by Monday. Learn it permanently. So it's very powerful. And these kids, they were drowning in failure, right? Now, that's another key principle is what we call through the research. We found research that suggested students need to have nine successes for every one failure um, in order to learn at their maximum possible rate. So it's sort of like a, an airplane and it's running out of speed, and an amateur pilot would pull back on the joystick, and the plane would fall out of the air and crash. When you have, well, what, you, what you have to do is have the, the plane pick up speed. Well, that's what our software does. It gets these students to pick up speed. It comes down to their level to where they can do nine successes for every failure, and it gets them moving at very high speed, very high velocity, and then it starts to move them up in, uh, in, in skill level. And we call that going Catch from, the wave, dude. so they're swimming and drowning and all of a sudden in our software they're surfing and moving at a high rate of speed and, and high gain. Yeah, so that creates fluency because now they're using the wave to push them forward rather than having to expend a whole lot of effort. As you saw in the video in the beginning, it looked like he was exerting minimal effort to answer those questions. So basically, you know, so I sat next to this uh, crazy dude, uh, next to this crazy dude where we have all these crazy ideas. And that was the fastest three hour flight I've ever had because like next thing we know we're landing. <laughs> and then we got together, uh, formed, formed the plan and it started like, you know, working away at, at these ideas. Uh, so, you know, and then here we are again at ACT, we come full circle three years later. And, uh, and that pilot program that we did last spring it, uh, yielded incredible results. But since I'm the tech guy, as you all know, because with technology, it solves all the problems, like, you know, white, interactive whiteboard solves all our whiteboard rules so we don't have to, you know, rewrite stuff again, right? Uh, of course, like we know, iPads came out and that's changing it, uh, that completely changes uh, everything uh, with 
with learning. Emma. So. Emma. Uh, iPad replaces Emma. a lot of stuff, right? properly, you know, we get incredible results. So let's get ready to see how this is action. Ready player one, which Great. is a really, I love that, I can't wait for the Steven Spielberg movie to come out. Because this book talks about my generation, the gaming generation, so when you watch this movie, you might get a, a tiny glimpse of, into our crazy world. But the thing is like, you know, it, our life is, is like a video game now. We look at the world like a video game. So, so we, when we pull this up, this is our team score that looks like in front of, of this, this, the classroom. And as you can see, we have a leaderboard. Ooh, taboo, bad, leaderboard, no. But when you use the leaderboard, it actually creates positive uh, reinforcement. But go ahead and describe these so aspects. The, every day they have an objective. So their objective here in this class period is uh, 16,000 points. That would correspond to um, roughly 6,000 uh, problems being correct um, that they would have to do as a class. The, again, they get real-time feedback here as to how uh, they're doing. At, at moving towards their goal. Each one of these students here has their own individual goal. And <clears throat> starting in January, we're going to have a real-time signal when they've achieved their individual goal. Um, so you'll know that immediately. You won't, you won't have to monitor that individually. And you can, you, so you get this whole feedback. You can see our top student here has done 55,826 problems correctly since the uh, beginning of us uh, putting it on the software. So in this case, that was uh, about 43 days earlier. And our um, bottom student here, uh, Carolina, she was at about 11,000. That's hugely less than 55,000, but it's more than enough to be successful. Yeah, and what made Carolina unique uh, in, in this situation? Well, I used to, to work with Carolina when she started. I thought, oh my gosh, she doesn't have a math circuit in her brain. <laughs> But she just stayed at it, just doing, cranking out 120 problems in the morning and another 120 in the afternoon. And by the end, she had what I called the rattlesnake, rattlesnake strike. These kids hit that keyboard so hard because they're so motivated. And so it's just a snapping of the finger that just happens very quickly as they're moving through. So the right hand does the return key and it's the left hand that's putting the numbers in. And they move. They can just. They can just generate enormous speed. So she got there. She ended up. She was doing 43 problems a minute, which was right in the mix of the very, of the very best students. So even the most challenged student can do very well. So uh, by the way, before I forget, there's a there's a sign up sheet circling around. Where's the sign up sheet? Back here. Back there. So if anyone hasn't put their email down, we're gonna email the presentation. Just in case. Um, raise your hand. So, so this is a, a critical importance, and, and, and they love this. They love the, the, the scoreboard, the, everyone working together, team, and when they achieve that goal, they get like rewards, and, and like you know, when you talk about hunting, like you know, one of the, one, food is a great motivator, right? <laughs> yeah, we, we do things like, we make that team score important, so we'll set objectives. When they hit 20,000 total problems correct, we'll say, we'll have a pizza party. When they hit 30,000, we'll have another one. So it's the same kind of, you know, we achieve as a team, we feast as a team to get that signal. We have some other things, we call it the Gervin store. So when they hit their objectives, they can get a Gervin dollar to buy the junk. The kids love, you know, racers and uh, marker pens and that kind of stuff. Slime. <laughs> yeah, so, so one of the cool things that we saw as a result of like, you know, them getting really into it is like they're highly energized. Uh, like you saw in the first video, like, you know, how he was like, he had this ritual. So, you know, here's a... Okay, why don't, you, why don't you go through and do what you do when you get ready to do so like, you know, Pumping yourself up. I'm asking. And it's just so funny to watch. Okay, are you all ready? Okay, we're going to come around. Yep. Okay, once you get ready and, and uh, go, and we will uh, show them. This is Derek, our number one student, 55,000 math problems. Francis Knuckles. Do Kate Compass Mathematics, and, and then we'll show them what you can do. This is Crandon, number th or rank number three. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> so are you ready? Yeah. All right. So so let's talk a little bit of the mechanics of how you know how we uh, how that you know, when you saw the game, the game going off earlier. This is the, here's some of the mechanics that are going on behind the scenes. So all the problems are aligned to the K through 12 standards, the common core, as you might call them, or um, and each problem type is expressed in all iterations. So they will see all these kind of varieties. Three plus four equals seven. Seven minus three equals four. Seven minus four uh, or seven minus three. So all variations of that same problem, yeah. they'll see it in various ways. So they can't just do this by rote. They're actually thinking algebraically as they move through these problems. Yeah, where the um, there are word problems that interjected. So we're trying to engage both sides of the. The, so instead of just using a plus symbol, we'll have plus spelled out, P-L-U-S. So we, in a variety of ways, we're interjecting words so that they begin to think not just mathematically, symbolically, but also verbally. So these, we're going to be injecting a lot more word problems in there. And, that, and that's going to be critical. We think it's going to be a critical breakthrough in the software because if you, if you go to the typical at-risk student and you said three above four, they wouldn't know that you're talking about seven. They would be confused by that. Or if you said um, five below, five below eight, they really wouldn't know that. So that's going to be a whole new iteration in the software that we're bringing out in January. That okay. whole to, to be able to break through with these students and not only give them enormous fluency on symbolically, but also um, conceptually. And you know, here's uh, you know my areas like we also put. You know, in the back end, uh, I have a response to artificial intelligence uh, using big data to be able to crunch these numbers and see you know, how students like you know uh, react to the different problems and, and basically you know in a way creating a uh, individualized uh, um, uh, uh, learning for for them. So a lot of that's going on in the background. And thank goodness for like the computing power because we would not have been able to do this like five years ago. You know, without the, the cloud infrastructure. That I don't have. response theory is critical because what you want them to do is you want them to be going up the mathematical uh, ladder at the fastest possible speed. And in order to do that, you, you want to use item response theory to make sure that as they go up that ladder, when they grab this rung, the next rung is right here. You don't want it four foot up. You want it right here. And so they can just move very smoothly. And so we're doing constant item response theory analysis to make sure that curve is as smooth as possible. We would like to think that the standards people got it down to perfection, but what, what you find when you apply an item response theory to the standards is sometimes when a student grabs this run, the next run is it's too far up and they, and they can stall out. So you have to know, you have to monitor the flow so they're going down the river at the fastest possible speed or going up, you know, climbing the ladder at the fastest possible speed. What I call cool stuff. And, and the thing about, uh, that's my favorite is like, Achievements, badges, everyone loves badges and stickers and things like that. So we throw that interspersed that uh, everywhere as well. So those are the mechanics, but really what it comes down to with fluency is this. If you really want to understand the challenge that our students from poverty have, and you have to understand this right here. When a student undertakes a new mathematical challenge, there's an enormous cognitive load on the brain. And as they practice more and more, it gets down to where it's just a pinpoint. And you'll see that with these students. But after they've done these math problems 10,000 times, you can clearly see that it's taken a lot less effort. 10,000. <laughs> but this is critical because if you have this kind of load with the lower challenges, the multiplication, the addition, they can't do fractions. There's just too much of a cognitive burden on the brain. You have to free up those cognitive resources. And nobody has been able to break through and get the levels of practice that you need to do it. It's incredible the number of practices that these students have to do in order to get off their fingers and just do it automatically in their brains. Nobody's been able to achieve those volumes. So, so all those things come together to create the highly motivated students so that they would do thousands and thousands of math problems to, to the point where they're not even thinking about it. Like the first video you saw, was he even thinking about the, 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 the answer? It just instantly, it was like instant recall, instant recall because of this enormous amount of practice to get down to that level so they could and as, as the, they move up in levels, you know, it goes like this, goes like this, and it goes like this again, and it goes like this, because it's like you know, constantly exercising the brain muscle as they're moving up the levels. That, you know, if that kid was like uh, level 30, we have 700 levels currently built out. 
Uh, so basically, you know, John, like, you know, this is a research project we did last last uh, spring from March to May with these students. You have 22. Yeah, so we had 22 students. Started the year, I went around each student and said five plus four. Not a single student could say nine. Started fourth grade. Um, so that's that was our starting point. About one third of them, tragically, um, they um, they couldn't even get it on their fingers. Five plus four. They uh, they were 1.8 years behind. The you know just on scale scores below the statewide averages for uh, the end of third grade at the beginning of fourth grade, and they were three years below the fourth grade standard. So, an extremely at risk uh, population. Yeah, so, so, so you saw the video of the game. Let's just like get a little quick refresher of the. Uh, so you saw Garani. This is Derek. All right. So this. Is Derek. So Derek, I understand you're currently ranked number one in the world in KP Compass Mathematics. Is that the case? <laughs> In this class, yeah. huh? He's so in the, the last 40 right? days, how many problems have you done? Okay, why don't you get ready and uh, go and we will uh, show them what you can do. Okay, you ready? Okay. He has some knuckles left. <laughs> Let's do it. I sped up this video because we don't want to watch the whole thing over again, so we're just going to you know, go through it faster. So this is like sped up. This isn't real. Uh, and then we can get back to real time. But the, other, but the point is, you know, we have these videos that are awful, like the first one, but we don't want to spend two minutes watching this. All right, there we go. Now he's getting to the end. There we go. Now we can watch it again later, but, you know, we want to get to our next point. Oh, one red. There's one red. Wow. So, 58 right and, and one wrong. You, that was really 59 right. And uh, so you missed it. You, you can see it. he's done a total of 497 and correct and 508 in total. So he got about uh, he had about 11 errors in class. Typically, what you'll see is when they get when they get to complete success, you'll see three, two, or one typing errors. As they move through, because they're just going so minute. fast on the keyboards. Like so, this. and you know, if it's three, two, or one, it's typing errors. But if it's four, five, or six, then you 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 look a little bit and see if they're systematically having issues with some particular problem type. Yeah, inc incredible. I mean, this uh, that's an uh, that's an enormous amount of practice when you. Uh, so this is another case where we had uh, Alice on. Yeah, she was she was a very uh, uh, another unique case that, we, that you know. She came into the student English language learner. So English is not her native language, and she didn't have any degree of proficiency in it. But one thing she had was determination. And she just said very early on, she said, I'm going to take Derek down. <laughs> <laughs> and you, <laughs> yeah, so, she, you, so you'll see um, how she starts very low in the rankings because she joined it after the class had already been doing it a little bit. But she started doing an enormous number and that's of math problems, problems, well over a thousand a day. Like one of the you know the factors of the leaderboard, she's like she, she's inspired by these high performers instead of being felt like they're taken down. So a lot of these kids are inspired. So here we are. I'm gonna move my finger to where she's at. So she's about here right now, Alison, and there she is uh, moving up to number ten. And oh, where'd she go? I lost her. There we go down to thirteen again, and she's steadily moving up. And yeah, it's just incredible. Like, you know, throughout the weeks, like she's she's like working hard, working hard. You know, getting up the leaderboard. Uh, things are changing. There's Derek up there, and there's Komisha, um, and they change spots. And in the end, she ends up uh, at the at the nine week mark at number four. So, so she, I mean, Derek just wasn't gonna let anybody catch her. <laughs> <laughs> He knew what everybody was doing, and, and you would just about have to stay up overnight to catch up to him. But, uh, um, but it just gives you a sense that in this highly teamwork environment, these students are acutely aware of where they rank um, in terms of the number of problems, and they're acutely motivated to do better. Um, um, the, um, um, the students at the bottom, they, they, they really want to move up that ranking. They're critically aware how many problems do I have to do more than the next person to be able to move up in that rank? So here's the results after nine weeks. So they typically would start out doing 10 problems a minute, but actually even lower than that in their very first tries, three or four problems a minute. And the range that they were doing at the end would be 30 to 75 a minute. 
They move from error rates of 25%, even at very basic problems, to they, at the end, almost all the students would get down to error rates of 6%, six per, six so which would be so symbolic of time, typing errors. This is the best part. Okay, so this happened, this probably happened in, uh, in spring, so March or May, they went to, they went away for the summer, and as we all know, when you go away for the summer, your brain turns to mush. But this is the most phenomenal uh, thing that we saw. And when they came back in the beginning of the new year, I had seven new students. There's highest turnover in the student population. And it had taken me about three months to create this mathematics culture. And I thought, wow, I'm going to have to start all over again. But it took minutes, minutes to create the culture. I was stunned. The, you, you still had Derek there, you still had Durrani, you still had Trandon, and these are dominant African-American men swaggering around, bragging about their math scores, and the other kids looked at them and said, I want to be like them. And they just went to town, like day one. They didn't, didn't take you know, time to develop the culture and, and talk about the team score, they just took off. And these kids moved very rapidly up to uh, rapid paces of practice. And they the got into the culture immediately. And the culture, not only the culture, but the, the kids who came back, they started at the same level and they kept going. Yeah, up. immediately. Yeah. Within, uh, within the first day or two, they were back at their speeds that they left with and met. This is a critical part when we talked about that signal. What this means is this is permanent learning. They're burning this in permanently. It's not being stored chemically. So you have two different types of storage in your brain. One is chemical storage, and one is actual biological change, where you grow, you grow new uh, uh, axons and dendrites and all that. And we do a tremendous amount of chemical storage in education, where they know the problem on Friday, and they can answer the test on Friday, but come Monday, the chemical <laughs> yeah, sure knowledge has, you know. has moved away, and, there's, and, and quite a bit of that's lost. Mm -hmm. So we, we had very little to no uh, loss over the summer. So this is like this is this is the results. Like so, it's not just the fact that they're great, but this is the the very end of your test. Yeah, we ended up with three students here. The typical gain on our AZ merit test is 25 points. We had three tests who cranked in three students here who cranked in at four academic years of progress. Our average um, student cranked in at 44 points of gain, um, well over the statewide average. The beautiful thing was we had gain all the way across the board. What happens in the typical classroom is you have actually have a fair number of students who measure academic loss, who score lower this it's, year it's than they did on the test in the prior year. Most people aren't aware of that, but it's a good chunk of the student population scoring lower. It's the nature of those tests. So we were very happy that we had positive gains across all of our students. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, this. This is, is our mission. This is the uh, ethnic achievement gap right here. It's 55 points in fourth grade. This is National Assessment of Educational Progress. It expands to 73 points in eighth grade. And so our mission is not only to reduce this, but to reverse it, to have our at-risk students outperform Caucasian students. And at our rates of growth right now, we can get there by the 12th grade, in other words, if you can maintain this level of growth that we, we saw this in that first implementation, you go along this path. We're convinced that we're only scratched the surface, that we can get much better than we're doing so far. This is just the first pilot. So, yeah, so this, we, think, we think that we can crank that, we think we can crank that up even higher. higher. Yeah, that's going to be incredible. And uh, this is the psychometrics of, of how they were going through time. Yeah, when you take a look at it through the atom response theory, their psychometric Productivity went up like this very rapidly with the newness of the game, settled out, and then cranked along this path right here. And we're convinced with our new version of the software that we are going to crank, be able to crank this up at a, um, and move it at a higher pace. So the way I look at this is like, it's like, you know, you, you start out burning a lot of fuel, and you get to this point, then you kind of settle out, and then now you're gliding. So, so they kind of, they reach that critical point where like now they're gliding, they're not using as much effort, and they're steadily increasing their, their, their way up on the, uh, on the literacy scale. So it's incredible. <clears throat> OK, so back to, the, that, back to our original slide. It's all about creating this, where you're not even thinking about the answers anymore. So you can use your brain to do more complex problems, to do geometry, to do uh, 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 
calculus to be able to do, to do application and things like that because now math is not a problem. It's, it's inherent in their, in their DNA now and, uh, and they could do a lot more with that. So, so, you know, so we got together and then this is actually the first time we, we, we came up with this. Uh, so we, we're thinking about, we're going to call this, uh, this program fluency. So putting the, uh, the intelligence in math fluency. Well, that's a misspelling, but you know, on purpose, <laughs> in a way. So here we are, you know, we're here to make a change. You know, we presented our finding, you, know, you, you came to the session because we wrote about like, you know, how the heck do we create fluency. Now, now we showed you how we create fluency, and we want to, uh, we, want to uh, we had this one pilot program, and we're looking for people to, uh, to become other pilots this spring. So, so we're, you know, one of the things that I'm gonna send out with the email that, that goes out is basically uh, an application to say, hey, are you interested or do you know somebody who's interested in, in test driving this out in the spring? Because uh, we, made, we got great success this one time, but can it happen again? You know, this is like bleeding edge technology. Like, this is stuff that, like you know, John said, like, no one's ever really, really cracked because we created these, took these seven key principles and put it all together. And you know, we, we had stumbled a little along the way, but like you know, but once it got it together, you know, it was starting working like like a like a like a cog in a, in a well-oiled machine. So so you know, we want pilot programs. We're looking for anybody who who you think is interested. If you're interested in trying out, we want to try diverse uh, uh, backgrounds, diverse environments, diverse ages, and things like that. Because we feel that you know, if we think, do this right, anybody can succeed, including. You know, high-level learners, high-level learners who are highly motivated can still benefit from this. But really, we want to take these at-risk youth who, who have, like, basically a, a, a no hope in math to something that can become, that give them some brighter future. So, so now we have about uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. I have got a uh, question from the back, and this is our contact information if you want to reach us. I actually wrote my email down in the <coughs> paper, so. Uh, so, question, sir. Uh, so, in Derek's example, where he's just flying through this stuff, he, he's mastered this skill. Um, where, where does the teaching happen? So, if he goes on to another skill, is there part of the program that does the teaching, or is it the work hand in hand with the teacher, the instructor teaches, then once they learn the skill, then they practice it here? The, um, great our, question. Our, yeah, great question. What I've done is I circulate around through the classroom. And, and I watch the board, how the productivity is going, and how many problems they're doing in a minute. And if I notice somebody that's going a little bit slow, then I'll just go over to them and give them some personal tutoring. One real attribute of the environment is the high level of motivation we've been able to achieve with the students. And so it's been relatively easy to put, give them new skills or to teach them if they're having a systematic problem with one problem type. So we haven't really, um, address that too much. And part of our intuitive thinking that's really a challenge sort of get your hands around is that these kids are really a genius at sort of figuring out new things. Bingo. And, and they become very aggressive. Like they're all becoming more aggressive about learning fractions and, and wanting to take that on as a skill. Um, so independently of the software. So this is really a practice software to give them the base. Uh, basics to make them successful in the other areas. Yeah, and, and the thing is, like you know, from my perspective, you know, that's the education. Um, blah blah. blah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, but for me, like I'm a gamer, and these kids are gamers, and we learn through trial and error. So as they're going through it, they're seeing what's wrong, and basically their their brains are making those linkages. Like you know, this is the wrong answer. This is wrong. oh, this is right. This is right. And then so through trial and error, through like experimenting, through trying, they end up creating this level of fluency as well through 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 answering so many multiple, so many questions. And the thing is, it won't let them level up until the next level, until they, they, they come to a level of fluency at that level, and then they, they ratchet up to the next one and the next one. So basically, they're just going through lots and lots of practice. You know, they're learning it through, through, through doing it. And for me, for video games, like when I play a video game, you know, I'm gonna go through it, and I know I'm gonna fail horribly, because I don't know the level. But once I start learning the level, I'll do better and do better and do better, and then uh, go through that process. So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Right. Okay. So on your examples that are all elementary kids, did you try uh, with high, high schoolers? It's easier to get elementary kids excited, but I have elementary kid children, but I yeah. teach high schoolers, and 
it's so easy to get them well, excited yeah. and bought on. That's why this is the first pilot. Uh -huh. you know, this is brand new. Yeah. We haven't done high school kids. But, but but we want to do high school well, we kids. Were, we are very anxious to do it. We want to see it, you know. So, so that's why we're looking for pilots, you know. We want people to go, hey, does this work? No, yes, maybe. So suppose you were to do it with a group of high school students. You would know the answer to your question within an hour, within a very short period of time. The cost of setting this up, it's really you can set it up very rapidly. So you could run the test and see if high school kids get as motivated as other students do. Mm -hmm. But one thing you keep in mind is a lot of the high school kids and at risk in alternative schools have never experienced success. One thing we can guarantee you for those students, they will guarantee success. We start them at the bottom of the ladder and, and they can climb up. They will be able to climb up very rapidly if they're up here at a skill level of 30 or 40. They'll be able to climb up very rapidly. And you'll see it flow would, out. Would you have topics that are high school appropriate? Oh yeah, we have like, we do have like multiple levels. There's 700 levels in our program. So 700 levels. So, you know, as, so they, they make their way up through from from very simple mathematics to algebra to uh, to uh, fractions, decimals, uh, square roots, whatever. You know, it's a, so it's pretty pretty diverse. And you know, speaking of cost, like the, the pilot that we're offering for these uh, people, you know, for the five pilots, we're doing it for free. So it's not going to cost you anything but your time and for giving us feedback. Because we really want very to little time. It, 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 yeah. They've done a great job with making it very easy to set yeah, I'll use type in the names of your with keyboards. Ten key if you have it, but but yeah, but they adapt to any any environment. So so you started with like the regular keyboard, then you got the ten, ten keys, and they you know, they slow they were a little slow, but then they started running ten key, crazy. So it's it's we, yeah we want to go. Um, just a heads up, I teach gamification for high schoolers, and it works actually I would argue better with high schoolers than it works with the elementary kids. So gamification works awesome. really well. Um, so my question is, um, scaling, so you're talking about the, the higher levels, so like, I mean, I teach for calculus, it takes my kids, you know, 20, 30 minutes to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So what does level 700 look like? I mean, are you still, I mean, because you, there's no way in hell a kid's going to do a thousand problems in a day, they're going to be lucky to get through eight. Yeah, so, well, the thing is, like, you know, we're talking about fluency in the most basic mathematics, so when they, when they start going up through the, through the ladders, you know, they're, they're doing very basic mathematics, and as they go up, you know, the, everything compounds and builds on itself. So if you know the instantaneous answer of 37 minus, seven, minus 2, or not minus 2, minus 42, or something like that, then as you're building up the ladder, then you're going to spend less time computing computing those, those the basics and then you can be more calculus. So, yeah. so that's the whole entire thing. The, the, the software itself, you can adjust the games from one minute up to five minutes. Yeah. So as they get up closer to level 700, we're going to be able to make that adjustment. But this is not a calculus um, or advanced algebra um, software. It's the all of the foundational skills. But at the same time, know this. We have about 80% of our students all the way up through the end of high school that just simply don't know fractions. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's so what, we, what, we, what we want to do. What we want to do is increase the number of students that are flowing into your calculus class. We, we want to quintuple that. And we are confident that we can do that, get a lot more students ready for your class and, uh, and ready to be successful in your class because you undoubtedly are aware that there's a good percentage of your students that they, they are in the calculus class, but they're, they're probably not really ready for it. They're ready for success in calculus. So but <laughs> but, we, but we, what we can do is we can guarantee a you a great flow of students that are really ready for success. They, they have all this stuff. So this down. is a little glimpse. I'm gonna just pull though, if it works. We're pulling up the kind of like our leveling system. Although this is like secret sauce stuff, so no one write it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but this and is like yeah. Let's see. We have another question. On, so doing? when you all did this, was this in a regular classroom or like a, an enrichment class or like a? This was right in the regular one. class. Um, I come into the class, um, I distribute the computers to the, to the students, I take them from 8 to 9 in the morning, and then I take them from 2 to 3 in the afternoon, so they do two, two cycles of this a day. And so my typical student is doing 350 problems in the morning, and then they're probably closer to about 320 in the afternoon. So the productivity drops a little bit, about 10% or so in the afternoon, but it's still really, I mean, Doing 320 problems is a lot of math problems to do. So I, that's another benefit of this environment is you can go at it 
more than you would think. You can go at this twice a day. Yeah, so okay. you know, these are just like some, like, this is basically kind of like our, our blueprint in a way for the different levels. We have 30 tiers, 700 plus levels, and basically like, you know, as students are... Why don't we stop it just for a second? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, this, this is our IP, so... <laughs> um, yeah. What do you want? What do you want me to go to? Now, do you have like two-step equations? Like I don't know. I I see one step and yeah. Else. So you have some with X on both sides of the yeah, equation. Yeah, X on both sides, please. Now this is following the standards. So this is all basically what the Common Core standards dictate um, at each uh, basically each level. Move up a little bit closer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So what do we have wrote? Stop for a second. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> groups of 10, A times B equals T times B plus X times B. Yeah. So you're looking for this right here. So you can see we're really challenging them to be able to Yeah, it's built very, very on foundation. So uh, when they, if, we, if we can get them through this, they're going to be thoroughly ready to be excellent at algebra and trigonometry. And I mean, are any, any of these standards above sixth grade standards? I, well, the, 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 the standards that we, we... I think it's the standards all the way through um, um, sixth grade. I wouldn't say necessarily that they're above the sixth grade standards, but I would say they're well above the average high school student's ability. So they're, you know, obviously well above that, but as far as the seventh and eighth grade standards, trying to remember exactly how algebra gets woven in there. So there's a lot of algebraic thinking in this, obviously, and so they're going to be excellent at algebraic skills, but I would have to go back and, and do a little bit more detail in there. And, and the thing is, the, the new tiers that we, we launched into, uh, into like this for the spring project, so it's going to be incredible. So yeah, things so like quadratic equations, I think they would be a little bit short of that. But yeah. certainly but the thing would, is that they have the foundation, they should be But it would quadratic. certainly get them ready to easily do yeah. quadratic yeah. equations. Yeah, so, yeah, so, equations. so this is pretty inspirational, right? <laughs> I love this stuff. Um, guy, uh, in the back? Yeah, so each level has its own difficulty, I imagine. Yes, but so basically the way the levels, I mean, we have groups of tiers and levels, so basically when they're in a higher level, you know, they're, 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 they're getting questions uh, above and below. So it's not just only that level. So, so it goes up and, up and down three so as they're kind of ratcheting up, so it's like, you know, Oh, actually, this way, you know, kind of like that as we're getting those equations. So, so it's the way, so when I saw, when I show you the showed you the level blueprint, you know, that's that specific level where the software, you know, adapts to each student as they're progressing through that ladder, like you described using I response. I had only response theory. I had to go through two years of speech class to, uh, because I was ESL. But anyway, <laughs> so each question is randomized in a way. It's not the set. Oh, very, very much so. Yeah, so if we go back to we watch another video, you can see like, you know, within that level, if you look at each question, like, you know, the, the, the variable moves around, uh, and then the numbers and the values change uh, dramatically as well, but it's all within the level, so because they're, what they're doing is they're building that foundation in their brain uh, for that specific standard, and then once, they, once the, the system uh, measures that they achieve that standard, then they ratchet up slightly more, and then they can stay at that level, and they ratchet up some, slightly more. And so, so, so it adapts to them that, that method. So, and it, and it definitely keeps them randomized because that's one of the things in gamification. It's like it, it has to be challenging. If it was easy, then they get bored quickly. So we're creating a level of challenge that's not too difficult that they lose lose heart, but enough so that they they want to keep in, and be engaged as well. So I was watching one student um, um, just last Wednesday, and he was dealing with problems 17 times 16. And he was just Typing the answer, 13 times 14. Typing the answer, and then, but all of a sudden he would get one like 18 times 19, and he whips out his pencil and he's, you know, doing some calculations. So he didn't have that one um, memorized yet, but he was, you know, going through. Uh, I, I know I had a visitor in there watching, and the, and the visitor was like. God, I couldn't do any of those. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just be able to. I wish I had he was, this one. He was, yeah. just, he was just doing them like that. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's... it's fluency, literacy, it's it's instantaneous. Yeah. You uh, had, had a question. I missed this earlier. Is this software ready for sale or is it... Oh, no, no, no. This, we're looking for people to pilot it, and we're doing it for free. 
like you know, so we're like we want we've got one success. We want to have five or so successes this spring, and maybe like in the fall, maybe a dozen or maybe a summer program. So so you know, we're presenting our findings. We're just saying this is what we did. We want some crazy people out there to go. I want to jump jump on board on something like this and uh, and test it out because so it's not ready for sale. No, no. <laughs> we don't. Maybe maybe two three years later down the road. Yeah, we don't, like, we don't have the capacity to handle more than four or five pilots. Yeah. And we got an awful lot of interest when we were out on the trade yeah, we're all volunteering so to I do would this. encourage yeah. you that if you think you would be interested, it it doesn't it's not a large investment to say to say, I wonder if these guys are real. It's, it's not gonna take you a lot of time to figure it out. You're gonna know very quickly. I mean it it you know Are you gonna raffle out? Well, we're gonna we're gonna send out an application. So you're gonna tell tell us about your environment, where you are, and based on certain criteria, we'll contact you and say you know so you know, and do a little interview, kind of, you know like a little job application. Because we want to make sure it's a it's a good fit. You know, we don't want to throw it out there and have instantaneous failure. We want to make sure that we're prepared to be able to handle your needs uh, so, and things like that. So some things that are important is to have decent Wi-Fi capacity into the classroom mm -hmm. and. and to have the ability. It doesn't have to be really great, but it has to be decent. Because yeah. And to have the ability to project the team score. Everyone has somewhere it. up on the on a board somewhere. A keyboard. Yeah. Go, oh, yeah. Although we have a we we now have a mobile version, so so kids are actually faster on the mobile because they, they have the ten key on the mobile, so they're actually faster on using the, the digital keypad now than the physical keypad. So like. Shh, I, I, do it, I do it in one classroom where there's no ability to project and the students are forever sprinting over to the computer that keeps the team score yeah. to see what's my score and it just drives me crazy. And, so yeah. it's better than project it up there. They, you know, yeah, so there's certain the requirements that we need to make sure. Because if they had the team score like where they could see it, then they wouldn't even have to look up and that probably... Well, that, those are refinements and things that we're, we're thinking about doing, whether we do it. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you had a, you had a question. Now, are you looking for like a whole group of kids or say 25 in one class? So, so for instance, we have the kids that just, they can't do all that. We need to get them to that point, and I'm sure every school probably has that issue. Are those the type of students that you're we, looking for? Exactly. And is it like 25 that you're going to pilot we, in that school? The one thing that's, Fairly important is that it be the same students every day, or very close to, yeah. to the same students, so they can have the sense that they're a team, not fragmented. So if you get the sense that we're in this as a team and we're together, that's all. That's that's the only. So these can be very highly at risk. Okay, and then it would be, it, you know, you can't be everywhere at the same time. You would. How do you train the teacher, or how or how do you? Oh well, we, we, we're we're putting together like like a, like a guide and things like that to basically you know, teach you how how we mimic it. And a lot of it's like you know you know we will give you what we did, and some of it has to be adapted to your environment. So uh, so we're gonna you know, we need people who are I mean who are in a way where like you can think creatively. So you you're not trying to follow the letter because it's, it's still highly experimental in the sense where we're we're still trying to figure out you know, what works in what environment. And that's why this is a pilot and we're not charging anything. And do Chromebooks work? Oh yeah, absolutely. Chromebooks are wonderful. It's actually built on a Google infrastructure. Yeah, it's been amazing to me. We we don't get the black rectangle of death. You know, so, um, and we can provide a lot of support. Um, it's okay. it's not hard to set it up. You yeah, type, you type in the names. Uh, you select passwords for the students. They type in their names. Type in their password. They click two buttons, and they're up and going. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, any other questions? I know the next session is coming in, but we can also be in the hallway and answer any questions. And you're well. going to send us in those. Yes, yes. Okay. And everybody signed in to let us know. Yeah.